Hello, my name is Claudia Rickert Isom, 1999-2000 Chair of the Florida Bar Standing Committee on Professionalism. I'm privileged to be here today to interview the Honorable Susan Cawthon Bucklew, United States District Judge for the Middle District of Florida, former Circuit and County Judge for the 13th Judicial Circuit of Florida in and for Hillsborough County in Tampa, Florida. Judge Bucklew was appointed to the Middle District in 1993 and was appointed by President William Jefferson Clinton after serving seven years as a circuit judge, preceded by four years of service as a county judge. We're meeting here today in Judge Bucklew's chambers in the Sam Gibbons U.S. Courthouse here in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, Judge Bucklew, and again, may I say what a privilege it is to be able to interview you for this historic video series. Thank you. Judge Bucklew, can you tell us briefly about your career starting with law school? Sure. Uh, I'm from Tampa, uh, which is where we're sitting now, and I went to Florida State University and graduated in 1964, and then taught school for several years, went back and got a master's degree, and didn't really go to law school until I was 33 um, or 34 years old. I went to Stetson College of Law and graduated in 1977. Um, about about uh, in my middle 30s, I would say, by the time I graduated, about 35 years old. And after you graduated from law school, where was your first employment? I went to work uh, right out of law school for Jim Walter Corporation, which is a uh, company that um, now is probably better known as Walter Industries, uh, but is still located and has its corporate headquarters here in Tampa. And I worked in their corporate uh, department, and there were probably about uh, 12 lawyers uh, in the, um, in the uh, corporation working uh, in the legal department. And I worked there uh, in Tampa doing um, a number of things. Um, I represented um, the Homes Division, uh, and then I did a few corporate matters. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a good experience. I had uh, children at that time who were about six or seven years old, and it was a good job for me because it, the hours were fairly stable. Uh, and I worked fairly close to my house, and it gave me an opportunity to not only practice, but also to be a mother, which was important at that particular time. Have you had mentors during your legal career or part of the inspiration for you seeking a legal career? You know, I'm often asked why I went to law school, and I really don't have any particular person that caused me to want to be a lawyer. I think it was uh, a combination of, of circumstances in my life. Um, one, knowing that uh, at that point I, uh, I was a single mother and was going to be responsible for supporting my children and, and would like or wanted to be in a profession where I could earn a decent salary in order to do that. Uh, and um, I had a father-in-law who was a very uh, active uh, attorney, uh, a trial attorney here in Tampa, and he loved the profession, and I suppose to some extent uh, he influenced me uh, about going to law school. But it's not a situation where I grew up wanting to be a lawyer, and this was always a, a lifelong dream. Actually, going to college, uh, it really never occurred to me uh, to go to law school. Um, when I graduated in 1964 from Florida State, um, women for the most part became teachers or uh, interior decorators or fashion designers or there there were certain narrow fields that women entered after graduating from college and usually the law profession or the medical profession or any of the professions was not one of those fields so it really had not occurred to me when I graduated from uh, college to even think of going to law school but 
um, once I once I graduated from law school, once I actually started working at Jim Walter Corporation, um, I was very very fortunate to um, have a man working there, uh, Jim Kynes, who uh, was a lawyer and was a former attorney general for the state of Florida, was a uh, great University of Florida football player, and. Uh, he, if, if anybody could be termed a mentor for me uh, in my professional career, uh, in my personal career at that particular point in time, it would have been Jim Kynes. Um, I learned an awful lot from him. Uh, he was the senior vice president for Jim Walter Corporation, but he had the responsibility for the legal department. And uh, as such, uh, I reported to him. And he not only was a wonderful person to work for, but he was a person who led by example. And he was very intelligent, uh, he was very hardworking, uh, and he was a very good man. Um, I learned an awful lot from him, and um, I think if I could term anybody a mentor, he would have been my mentor. In terms of heroes, then, even before you decided to go into the law, who would your heroes be? Gee, that's a hard question. Um, now I'm sure you get this answer a lot. Um, my mother probably had the greatest influence uh, in my life growing up. Uh, and if I had to say um, that I know a hero at that particular point in time, it would have had to have been my mother. Um, my mother was a um, stay-at-home mother. Uh, she didn't work outside the home. But we had a, or my family had a family business. And uh, when my father couldn't work, and that was that happened on occasion. My mother not only ran the family business, but she um, took care of us. Uh, she was the president of my PTA or when I was in junior high school. She was president of the PTA when I was in uh, high school. And she was another person that um, not only was a warm and, and wonderful mother, uh, but she also was a good role model for me as well because she was an example of, of something that I wanted to be like uh, when I grew up. Uh, she uh, was a very happy person. She was a person who volunteered her time. Uh, she was a person that um, was an example. Uh, and she was also a person that was a demanding, a demanding <laughs> person because she demanded a lot of me. Uh, and, you know, she was one of those people that, when you came home with anything less than an A, that was that was certainly not uh, an acceptable result. And I learned early on that um, if you got a report card and if there was anything on that report card less than an A, uh, I was in big trouble. But uh, I would say that as much as anybody, she would have been my hero growing up. I know my parents always used to say, "Just do your best." and they'd look at you because they knew that your best was an A. So, okay. In terms of um, obstacles or mountains, what mountains do you feel that you have climbed during your life and what mountains do you see ahead of you? Well, I would definitely say that when I was trying to go to law school with two children, I had twins and at the time I was in law school uh, they were about four and five years old, four, five and six years old, trying to go to law school, uh, be a single mother of twins and I even taught um, some courses at the community college during that time period was difficult uh, and that's putting it mildly. Um, I didn't get a lot of sleep during that time period and um, was, was tired a good portion of, portion of the time. That was, an, that was a big obstacle to get through uh, as to whether it was worth it, um, whether I would, um, if I had to start this all over again, would I do the same thing? Um, that was a huge obstacle. The, probably the other obstacles uh, that I've faced uh, during my uh, career have been obstacles associated with um, being uh, in the position that I was in at the time that I was in. 
Uh, and I don't know if you remember or not, but I was appointed um, a county court judge in 1982, in January of 1982. And there were three of us appointed at about the same time um, to other uh, judges um, who are still on the bench in the uh, 13th Circuit. And I happened to be the first female appointed. And when I was appointed, um, it created a, a real ruckus. Uh, and there were newspaper articles, and um, not just on the front of the Metro, but on the front of the uh, main section of the Tampa Tribune about whether this was a good appointment, whether this was a, a proper appointment, and so on. And I can remember to this day uh, coming back to um, where I'd worked uh, at Jim Walter Corporation and having lunch with, with Jim Kynes, who I had mentioned earlier, and I said, you know, this is really not worth this. Um, I just want to go back and, and do my job. I've, I've been a person that all my life has, has done the right thing, and now there are these articles in the newspaper that are questioning this appointment, and this is not not worth it. And uh, he um, sat me down, and in about 10 minutes, he sent me out that door and told me to get back down there to my job, <laughs> and that uh, it was worth it, and that I needed to suck it up and, and get busy and do my job. And, and that was the last time that I moaned and groaned about that. But those few weeks right after I was appointed uh, and the fact that it was uh, a little bit of a controversy and, and the fact that uh, I was a person who had never been in the newspaper before and all of a sudden was on the front page of the uh, main section of the Tribune, um, that was a, uh, an obstacle uh, that took some overcoming for me, for me personally to get past that and say, I can do this. Uh, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do a good job of this, and um, I'm going to get through this. And I did, but, but it was certainly an obstacle. Um, and those, those probably, those two times have prob were probably the hardest times uh, in my life. Well, that leads me to another question. Was it very comfortable for you at that time, realizing that a lot of women attorneys had their eyes on you and a lot of hopes and expectations for all of the women who practice law were riding on your success? Well, it was very stressful. It, it was stressful uh, for the reasons that I just stated, but for those reasons too, because I realized that. Uh, there weren't that many women attorneys at that particular point in time, uh, and I knew most of them. Uh, and I knew that was the case. Uh, I knew that if I messed up, uh, we wouldn't have another uh, judge for a while. Um, and so that, that was tough. It was, it was important, though, I think, uh, to realize that f for the, the hardships and the bad publicity that was happening at that particular point in time, and, and, and there were some, some bad times. There were also a lot of people who were really there rooting for me to do well, and, and people that you wouldn't expect. I mean, uh, women in the clerk's office, for example, uh, who uh, were very helpful to me and, and wanted me to do a good job and did everything that they could to make me look good uh, so that I would do a good job. So uh, I, I think that women, a lot of women then at that particular point in time, not just the women lawyers, but women in, in the other areas that uh, work with the court system were very supportive. Uh, in their own way and wanted me to do well. Uh, and so I, I had some help. It, it was stressful and I knew that that issue was there, but um, I had a lot of help. Well, 1982 doesn't seem that long ago to me, but I know in 1982 there was a popular perception at the time that you were appointed that a woman couldn't win an election. 
And now it's interesting to talk to some of the male attorneys and they feel that they're such a disadvantage if they're running against a woman for a judgeship because they feel like a woman can't lose. So in the last 20 years, a lot of things have turned around and you certainly had an important role in that turnaround. So on behalf of the women of Hillsborough, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things have changed, though. You know, in 1982, when I was appointed, uh, you're exactly right. That was, a, that was the philosophy that if a woman was going to reach the bench, that woman had to be appointed. Uh, although I will tell you that there were uh, women judges in Pinellas County. So we were just a little slow here in Hillsborough County getting the first woman on the bench because there were at least two other judges, uh, female judges in Pinellas County that were on the bench when I came to the bench in 1982. I remember we were talking before we went on camera. There was a time when the Women Lawyers Association was a, a, a loose-knit group of women who all met together, about 20 of us. And uh, we received an invitation one time from Pinellas to have a joint meeting to honor all of our judiciary, and that's before you took the bench. And we said, we guessed that they wanted to have a joint meeting to honor their judiciary, <laughs> their female judiciary, because uh, we thought they were rubbing it in. <laughs> okay, so in terms of being a woman, do you feel that your gender has held you back in the practice of law or being able to uh, be a member of the judiciary? Do you feel that gender issues have ever personally affected you other than what we've just talked about being a role model? Other than the example that I just gave you when I was first appointed, no. Um, I think a lot of that has to do, though, with being in the right place at the right time as far as I was concerned. Um, when I was a county court judge from about 1982 and to 1985, and there were no other women on the bench, um, I was treated differently, uh, but I can't say that uh, I was treated in any way that, that held me back. Um, I was sent, I can remember in 1983, I was sent to Plant City and there was, there was some discussion as to whether I would be able to survive in Plant City uh, as being a, a woman judge in Plant City. And, and they couldn't have been nicer. And again, it was a situation where people, uh, for example, women that worked in the clerk's office were extremely helpful to me and wanted me to do well and, and wanted me to succeed. Um, but that particular point in time, from about 1982 to 1985, uh, when there were no other women, um, it was a little isolated. Uh, and um, I can't say that I probably was able to participate uh, then in, in a lot of things that, that perhaps the other judges were participating in. But I don't believe that I was actually, um, I was actually held back in any way. Uh, and in 1986, when um, then Governor Graham uh, appointed me to the circuit bench, I think that um, being a woman was, and probably being a woman with some experience on the county bench, was actually helpful in, in my getting uh, that appointment. Now, in 1993, when I was uh, nominated by President Clinton and, and ultimately uh, confirmed by the Senate, I think that being a woman probably didn't didn't help and it, it didn't hurt uh, at that particular point in time in the Middle District of Florida. We already had three women uh, who were United States District judges, uh, Judge Kovacevic, uh, Judge Fawcett, and Judge Conway. And so three out of the 11 judges were women. So I don't think that, that was particularly harmful and I don't think it was particularly uh, helpful. Uh, I think things have almost come uh, full circle. Uh, there was a time, I believe, when being a, being a female, uh, or uh, whether it might have been a female judge or a female attorney, uh, had some, some benefits. I think law firms, uh, I think governmental agencies were looking for uh, women lawyers um, for whatever reason. I don't think that's necessarily the case today. Uh, and part of that is because there are so many women lawyers. And so um, that need to fill a space and, and to hire a woman uh, for your law firm or for your um, agency is simply not there anymore. 
Uh, so I don't think it's any advantage at all anymore uh, in being a uh, female attorney. In fact, uh, it may be more of a disadvantage now than it was uh, when I was coming up. Have you ever observed something in your courtroom or in a hearing where you felt that an attorney was taking advantage of somebody because of their gender, race, or ethnicity where you felt compelled to step in and intervene? I probably don't see it as much as perhaps some of my male counterparts because most attorneys are very careful in my court not not to do anything like that, uh, whether it might be uh, intentionally or unintentionally because uh, they're thinking about it because they've got a female judge sitting uh, on the bench. Um, I've stepped in a couple of times uh, where I thought a witness uh, was being unnecessarily badgered and the witness happened to be a woman. Uh, I've stepped in sometimes when I thought um, an attorney was not treating uh, opposing counsel uh, appropriately uh, and um, the opposing counsel happened to be a woman. But I'm not sure uh, that I'm not sure that that was simply a, not a situation where the person happened to be a woman and, and as opposed to uh, a situation where the person uh, a person could have been, uh, could have been a male and been in that position. I, I just don't think, Claudia, I see it uh, probably as much because persons, uh, attorneys who practice before me, persons who are in my court, uh, are very conscious that they have a female um, judge sitting on the bench. And there was a time um, when I was in state court when not only would there have been a female judge on the bench, but uh, the attorneys on both sides uh, were very likely to be women attorneys. Now, more recently, and in federal court, that's not the case, but there sure was a time when, when that was the case. You mentioned that you'd been a member of the Gender Bias Commission. Have you seen any changes from when that commission took testimony in the different examples that were included in the report do you feel that there have been some positive changes since that time? Yeah, I think there have been a lot of positive changes. Um, I was trying to remember exactly when the Gender Bias Study Commission um, actually uh, took place. And as I recall, it was about 1988, 89, 1990 in that time frame. And as a part of our uh, work, we had hearings in various cities around the uh, state. And I can remember being very surprised at some of the stories that we heard that not, not only from, from people who were not, or women who were not members of the legal profession, but from women who were in the uh, legal profession, uh, stories about examples of uh, harassment, uh, examples of discrimination. Uh, and I, it was a situation where I was very, very surprised because when I first joined the commission, I didn't expect to hear what I heard. But a lot of really good things came out of that commission, and I'm very proud to have been a member of the commission. And I can look back now and think that, that we did a lot of good. Uh, there was a lot of legislation that came out of that, um, things that had to do with, with everything from uh, an arrest policy uh, in um, when police go out and arrest uh, a domestic violence abuser to uh, women in prison and the educational possibilities uh, that they now have that they didn't have. Um, and even as far as the education of judges, um, there was a time in the state system, and I, I don't know if that's true anymore, where uh, every time we had a conference or every time we had an educational meeting, and there was a component of that uh, that had to do with um, discussion or education, uh, having to do with gender or having to do with race. Uh, in order to raise the consciousness of the judiciary. All those things started really with the Gender Bias Study Commission. 
uh, there was a, there have been numerous other study commissions that have followed that, but that was really the genesis. That's where it all started. And so from everything from legislation to uh, the way police officers behave to the way attorneys behave to the way judges behave, there are a lot of really good things came out of that, I think. So the courtroom uh, conduct handbook is just a small part of what came out of that commission. Now you talked about education. You've always been very involved in the education part of the judicial education. Have you carried that into your federal service? Well, there's a lot more opportunity in the state system to be involved in judicial education than there really is in the federal system. Uh, and you're right, I was very involved when I was a state court judge. Um, and since being becoming a um, United States district judge, I have been involved in educational programs, uh, but for the most part, it's not education of other judges. Uh, it's participating in um, continuing legal education programs. It's participating uh, by going out to schools and speaking to uh, high schools or, in a couple of instances, even uh, grammar school. Uh, so I have continued uh, to be very interested in education. It's just changed its focus a little bit because I think when I was a state court judge, the primary focus that I had uh, was judicial education. I did a lot with judicial education, and the focus has changed since I've become a district judge. You've also been very active in the American Ends of Court movement, and that's education related as well as mentoring. Could you talk a little bit about your involvement with that? Yes, and I have been very active, and I'm still uh, active. Um, I was one of the organizing members of the William Glenn Terrell Inn of Court, and that was also around 1987, 1988. Uh, and it was actually the second in of court uh, in this in the Tampa area, and we now I think we may be up to three ends of court, four ends of court, five ends of court. Starting okay. this fall, <laughs> five ends of court. Uh, and this fall, I'm I'm going to not only be a member of the William Glenn Terrell in of court, I'm also going to be a member of the um, criminal law in of court. So I will be attending two in of court meetings uh, every month. Uh, but yes, I have been active, and yes, I think it's a, it's a um, really good uh, program, and I think that not only I've learned a lot and gotten a lot out of it, I think that um, it's been a good thing for the bar, um, for the new attorneys, uh, for the uh, senior attorneys. Um, what we call the masters, uh, because I think even the masters of the bench can learn something, and I think that there's not uh, a meeting that goes by that they don't. Uh, and certainly the pupils who are the new uh, members of the inn, um, they learn as well. And it's, it's more than just going to the uh, inn meeting uh, and participating in an educational program. It's also being able to have dinner with uh, with other people in the bar or judges and, and just share personal stories, uh, be able to ask questions uh, that you may have of something that you're not quite sure about what to do about. Uh, it's being able to see a judge on the street and know that judge personally and, and being able to say hello and, and talk with them. Uh, I've had I've had pupils come over to my office and just sit down and visit uh, as a result of being uh, members of the end of court. Um, and I think that, and I'm not sure this is true of all, all of the ends, but we've also um, done a lot of mentoring outside the actual meeting time uh, where uh, where in members, especially the pupils, come over and watch, watch trial and then come back and we talk about it, uh, where they attend a deposition and um, then talk with the attorney who conducted the deposition. Uh, there's a lot of mentoring that goes on, and, and if it's done right, should go on uh, as a result of being a member of the end of court. I think it's a really good thing, uh, and obviously uh, it's grown uh, like crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember, we're, we're 50, my particular end, the Terrell end is the 50-something, 57th, I think, uh, end of court. and. Um, I don't know what we're up to now, but a whole lot more than that. 
The Florida Bar is in the process of setting up a formal mentoring program. It's been approved for 15 hours of continuing legal education credit for both the mentor and the mentee. Um, Tampa was chosen as one of the pilot programs. What, what are your thoughts regarding the need for mentoring for new attorneys? Oh, I think that's a really good thing. Um, attorneys, uh, new attorneys, if, if they go into a large law firm or if they go into a governmental agency, should, now they don't always, but they should get some mentoring. Um, but the, the attorney that graduates and hangs out a shingle and is a solo practitioner doesn't get any opportunity for any mentoring and it's I'm sure a scary thing so I think it's it's a real need and uh, that's a good thing. What changes have you seen in the legal profession since you first started practicing law? The biggest change I think is what we've talked about uh, the number of women who have entered the profession um, I think that's made a huge change. Obviously, the profession's grown <laughs> greatly, and there was a time when you knew almost all the lawyers, and obviously that's impossible now. Uh, there was certainly a time when I knew all of the women lawyers, and I don't even come close to knowing probably a tenth of the women lawyers now. But I think the um, the advent of, of the number of women entering the profession that have entered the profession in the last 10 years or so, maybe the last 15 years, uh, has made a huge difference. Um, it's made a huge difference, I think, in the way cases are handled. Uh, it's made a huge difference in the way trials are conducted. Uh, I think it's made a big difference in the, in the perception of the profession. Uh, by even um, those who are not uh, members of the legal profession. Um, women, women are different and, and they handle cases differently uh, than a man might handle a case. Um, I'm not saying one is good and one is bad, but it's certainly different. And um, I think it's had a huge change on the, on the profession. Do you feel that the legal profession has improved or that it's gotten worse? That's, that's, a, hard, that's a hard question. I don't think it's gotten worse. Um, I think that the legal profession, probably more than any other profession, has, has made a really big effort to try to improve its status and to try to improve uh, the perception that the public has and to try to improve its own professionalism. Um, the problem is there are just so many lawyers and any time you get that many lawyers or that many people in any type of profession, you are going to have some members that don't behave appropriately and the more people you have in a profession, the more you're going to have that don't behave appropriately. Uh, I think we're doing a better job than ever of, of trying to educate the public of trying to uh, emphasize the need for professionalism, uh, the need for ethical behavior, uh, the monitoring of, of lawyers and their unethical behavior. Um, I think that, that we do a better job of that than any other profession. Uh, but anytime you have the number of lawyers that you have, uh, it's still going to be a problem and you're still going to have some people who do not behave appropriately. But I, I think as a whole, uh, the profession is probably, um, is probably better as far as uh, behavior is concerned uh, than the past. There's also an additional, uh, an additional element here um, with the press and, and with everything being recorded and everything being on television. So if there is any slip, if there are, are those attorneys out there who are unprofessional or unethical, um, they're in the newspaper and they're on television. And so they're much more at the forefront than it w they would have been 20 years ago when they could have done the same thing and nobody would have ever known about it. But I think we're doing a good job with uh, professionalism and with education and with monitoring uh, our attorneys. I think we do a good job of, 
of offering services for attorneys that, that have uh, drug problems or alcohol problems uh, or some other type of disability. I think we do a good job by uh, offering advice. We have an ethics hotline where an attorney, if an attorney has a problem, can call. And I, a number of times I've had attorneys tell me, well, you know, I think I'm going to have to withdraw. I called the Florida Bar uh, hotline and they told me I needed to get off of this case. Um, so I, I think we're doing a good job. Many times people have assailed the right to trial by jury as, as being old-fashioned or, or too expensive in these days and times, and they've talked about alternative dispute resolution as, as a more economical way of resolving differences. Could you share with us your thoughts about the right to trial by jury? Well, mediation or arbitration I would agree is a more economical way to resolve differences. And I think that mediation and arbitration uh, or any other alternative dispute resolution program is important. And it does not only uh, keep uh, expenses down, but it also brings about resolutions that uh, perhaps in many cases are better resolutions, uh, that they are resolutions that have been worked out uh, as opposed to brought about by a, um, a courtroom decision in a, a contentious situation. Um, but there are some instances where uh, that just doesn't work, and that's when you need a jury to make a decision. Now, you know, I look at civil cases a little bit differently than I look at criminal cases. Um, I think that uh, in, civil, in, a, in the civil arena, uh, you're right. Uh, it's very expensive, uh, and sometimes the cases are extremely complicated, and sometimes other resolutions are better. In the criminal arena, uh, I don't think there is another resolution that's better. Um, trial by jury, I think, is not only not only a good way to resolve uh, the uh, criminal situation or or the or the crime, but it also gives that defendant uh, who is charged with a crime and who, when he comes into the courtroom or she comes to the, into the courtroom, is presumed to be innocent of that crime. It gives that defendant an opportunity to be tried by, in our case, 12 citizens of the community. Uh, and not by a judge who, who sits up there and, and who the defendant may think has no understanding of that particular defendant's uh, worth or that defendant's problems or anything else. It gives that defendant an opportunity to be tried by 12 citizens of the community and whatever the result, uh, whether it be guilty or not guilty, I think the defendant has a lot better feeling about the system than he or she would if, if he were being judged uh, by a uh, single person, by, by a judge. Now, you know, I always say that whatever decision the jury reaches is the right decision, uh, whatever it is. And uh, I believe that, and I always say that. Uh, now, have there been times when a jury's made a decision that I think, had I been on that jury, would I have decided that way? Sure, there have been times like that. But I don't think there's a better system. I think that it's, um, it's a way that the public can participate in the, in the justice system, and it's a way that the citizen who never comes into a courtroom and never has any contact with lawyers and certainly has little or no contact with the judge has an opportunity to come in and actually participate uh, in the decision-making process. And most of those persons that have served on juries hopefully leave here and they feel good about the system. So it's a, it's a good way not only to educate the public, but to allow the public to participate uh, and learn more about the justice system. So from everybody's standpoint, uh, from the defendant who's charged with a crime uh, to the public that gets to participate in the decision-making process, I think trial by jury is, is the best way of resolving disputes. 
Now, in the civil, civil situation, I don't disagree that there may be alternative methods that are preferable in many cases. How do you see the practice of law changing in the next hundred years? Well, I think certainly automation and technology is going to have a huge change uh, or a huge impact on the system. Um, when I can remember when I uh, was a state court judge and we got our first computer. It was like somebody just opened up a window and, and we actually uh, could go on and, and uh, online and look and see uh, what prisoner was in jail and what prisoner was not in jail. Of course, at that particular point in time, we couldn't talk to anybody else in the courtroom on the computer or anybody else in the courthouse or anybody else. All we could do is just go on and, and look and see who was in jail and who was not in jail. Uh, and obviously things have just changed terrifically. Um, we're sitting here and I have um, my computer in, the, in my chambers and in my courtroom I have an evidence presentation system uh, where I have a document camera and a VCR and monitors all set up. Uh, the way of conducting a trial is different uh, as a result of the technology in my courtroom than it was five years ago when I didn't have that technology. Um, I think that technology has had and will continue to have a huge impact on uh, the system. Um, if, if the number of attorneys continue to grow uh, and um, we get more and more people entering uh, the profession, uh, that's also going to have uh, a continued impact on the system. Uh, the number of cases that are brought to the system, uh, the need for more judges, uh, the need for more courtroom personnel uh, as a result, um, the number of people uh, that take part in the system, um, that's, we're just going to keep growing. It's a, it's a growing business. What can we as, as attorneys and as judges do to ensure that people have equal access to justice? Well, I think that, I think that the first thing that we can do as judges is to um, govern ourselves appropriately. And I think that judges and attorneys uh, have a responsibility, I guess judges especially, uh, in being, being role models and, and um, and being examples. Uh, I think that we also uh, can make sure uh, that the courthouses that we have the opportunity to work in uh, are open to everyone who has a uh, dispute that they need resolved uh, by the justice system, whether it might be civil or, or criminal. Uh, I think we have the responsibility to make um, the system uh, easy to access, whether it might be by um, putting our calendars on the internet or whether it might be by allowing um, attorneys or, or the people outside the system to be able to access docket sheets. Uh, whether it might be to um, keeping the courthouse open during business hours and the clerk's office open during business hours, uh, whether it might be having courthouses located in a convenient place where a lot of people will have access to the courthouses. Um, I think we very definitely have a responsibility in making sure that everyone has equal access. Now. Um, Obviously, uh, having equal access doesn't necessarily uh, always mean having access to an attorney uh, because you might come into the system uh, in representing yourself as opposed to being represented by an attorney, but you certainly can come into the system, uh, whether it might be here in the United States District Court and file a lawsuit, 
uh, and file a lawsuit and represent yourself, uh, just like if you hired an attorney. So I think we have a responsibility to make sure that the system is not just a system that is for companies or not just a system for rich people, uh, where they're the only ones that can use it. Uh, we meet, need to make it uh, available to everybody. What recommendations can you give to judges, lawyers, and law schools on how to improve the legal profession and or legal training? Well, let me start with judges because I should know the most about that particular area. Um, I think judges have a responsibility and part of that responsibility is being a role model. Part of that responsibility is being an example, both in, in court and out of court. Uh, part of that responsibility is conducting court so that when the attorneys come into your court, they know that they have to behave in a professional manner, that uh, they know that the rules of evidence are going to be followed, they know that professionalism is going to be extended to uh, not only the courtroom personnel but also to the opposing counsel. And I think the judge has a responsibility of creating that atmosphere and can create that atmosphere. Uh, as far as the attorney is concerned, um, I think the attorney uh, can also do a lot, uh, not only uh, by participating in things like we've talked about, ends of court, uh, by participating in CLE programs, uh, by um, behaving in a manner uh, just as I suggested that the judge should, should that he or she is a role model for those that are looking at that person and saying he or she is an attorney. As far as the law schools are concerned, you know, I think law schools have a responsibility for giving a substantive education or an education in the substantive law. And for professionalism uh, and for, I guess, training uh, in, in that area, I think it's harder for a law school to do that because they're, they're doing it uh, with, in, in, in sort of a sterile atmosphere. Um, there's no way to really put, put it into uh, play or there's no way in, in, to see it used. So I, I can remember going back to, to the time when I was in law school and, uh, they would talk about ethics and they would talk about professionalism and it really just didn't have any meaning at all. So I think that what, what the law schools need to do is to allow the intern programs and the clinical programs uh, to uh, take place and to encourage them. Uh, we have a program here where we have interns from Stetson uh, who come in um, about 20 interns every semester uh, and work with the judges uh, and with the law clerks uh, in chambers and not only watch the trials but also uh, participate uh, by discussing and, and working on proposed orders and that kind of thing. And I think that's a really good way for law schools to um, allow their students to see uh, a part of the profession that they wouldn't see when they were uh, over there in a classroom situation. So I think law schools can do their part by encouraging uh, internships, encouraging um, a uh, law clerk position for, the, um, for their students over the summer. Uh, encouraging uh, clinical uh, classes, that kind of thing. What areas do you feel like the legal profession is excelling in or, or doing correctly? Well, I think I said before, um, I think we do a, a great job uh, with education. Um, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't get something in the mail that says that the Florida Bar is offering uh, 10 courses, uh, that the Hillsborough County Bar is offering uh, another 10 courses, that the ABA is giving you the opportunity to participate in, in this educational program or that educational program. I think as far as continuing legal education, we do a wonderful job. Um, I, I bet there's nobody that comes close close to us. 
Uh, I think um, we offer also the opportunity uh, to uh, have that amount of training or, or a similar amount of training in the area of ethics and the area of professionalism. So as far as education and, and putting it out there and saying, here it's available uh, to all of you people who are members of the bar, I think we do a wonderful job. Now. The problem is there are always um, those members of the bar, uh, and I think um, there probably aren't a whole lot that don't take advantage of that. And um, it doesn't matter how good of a job the bar does with its educational program, uh, you can't always make everybody uh, participate. I think we're doing a pretty good job as far as our image is concerned, too. You know, we, we spend a lot of time worrying about the image of the legal profession, and we're never going to be able to do anything about that lawyer who, as I read yesterday in the paper, gets a million dollar verdict against him for sexual harassment, and it's on the front page of the newspaper. We're never going to be able to do anything about that. Uh, but what we can do something about is the way the profession is viewed as a whole. And I think we're doing a pretty good job with that. What areas do you believe can be improved upon in the legal profession? Well, I think that there are a few areas that can be improved upon. I think we, we, you touched on one earlier, and that's um, a mentoring program or some sort of help program for that lawyer who's not a member of the, law, of the law firm or that lawyer that's not a member of a governmental agency where he or she's not going to have somebody to pick up the phone and ask a question of. Uh, I think um, we need to fill that gap in some way. Um, you know, we try to do it a little bit with our ends of court, and we tried to solicit uh, solo practitioners, I remember for a number of years in my end, to try to get them into the end so that we could offer them that. But um, we, we weren't too successful in getting a lot of them uh, to participate. Maybe it's money. I, I'm not sure what it is. But um, we weren't very successful in that. But I think that we, we need to do something for that person that just graduates from law school that doesn't have a, uh, a firm or doesn't have an agency to support him or her and is in practice by themselves. So I think we could do a better job of that. Um, there, are probably, um, there are probably some other areas uh, that we could do a little bit, we could do a little bit of a better job on. Um, but, you know, I think education-wise, um, there's nobody that comes close to what the bar does. You mentioned a couple of voluntary bars. How important do you feel it is for an attorney and or a judge to participate in bar activities? Very important. And I say that because, um, you know, I think United States district judges uh, get a lot of criticism, uh, at least here we do occasionally, for not participating enough. Um, but I do think it's very important. I think that um, we have an obligation uh, to do that if we uh, are going to be in this position, that um, not only the, the local bar association, but organizations like the Ends of Court, for example, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's important. I think it's not only important to the perception that the lawyers have of the judiciary, but it's important to the judge as well, because it gives the judge an opportunity to uh, see how things really are and to get out of this little sterile atmosphere that we, we sometimes uh, tend to lock ourselves into. Uh, so I think it's important both for the bar and the judge. How about other community activities? I think that's important as well. I, you know, we are hindered to some extent uh, in perhaps doing some of the things that we would otherwise do um, if we weren't a judge. But I think that's important. I know I've served on a number of boards, uh, and all the way from the Salvation Army to um, the um, Girl Scout, uh, Suncoast Girl Scout Council, um, a lot of different boards, and I think that's important as well. It 
again, uh, not only is important for the community, but it's important for the judge as well. Um, for the community, it gives, it gives members of the community an opportunity to um, get to know you and perhaps for you to contribute a little bit and help a little bit in, in their endeavor, but it also gives you an opportunity to get out uh, outside of your particular realm. Uh, and the legal profession, there, there, is a, there is a tendency, I think, uh, for judges especially, uh, to get stereotyped and get into all legal activities. You, you know, you might participate in bar activities, you might participate in ends of court activities, you might go judge moot court programs over at the law school. Uh, and you don't get outside of that area, but I think it's important for lawyers and judges to participate in other um, other community interests other than just legal interests. So important, I think it's important. Okay, changing gears. How do you define ethics in the legal profession? <laughs> Well, my definition may not be everyone's definition. Um, my definition of ethics uh, in the legal profession is simply following the rules. Uh, we have rules uh, and uh, ethics are having the, um, having the ethics of the profession or the ethics of, prof of the profession is simply following the rules, the rules of professional responsibility. Uh, I guess I would, say, I would say that, you know, an ethical lawyer is something we would all, uh, we would all want to be, but that's probably uh, the minimum. Um, that we can be. Uh, we have to follow the rules. If we don't follow the rules, then there are certain results. Um, so I guess that's the way I would describe ethics, the rules. Could you contrast that with how you would define professionalism? All right. And again, this is certainly my definition. Um, uh, professionalism uh, is a lot more, I guess, than, than ethics. Uh, professionalism, I would, I would include um, civility, um, treating opposing counsel with civility. Uh, with professionalism, uh, I would probably also include competence, uh, doing a good job at what you do, uh, because you can be an ethical lawyer and you might not necessarily be professional in that you're competent. Uh, I think that uh, professionalism uh, is, um, is um, being honest and, and having integrity and, and being uh, a proud of your profession. Uh, so I would, I would view ethics as sort of the bottom line and professionalism is everything else, what we, what we would hope to be. Could you describe some of your core beliefs and values that have influenced you? <laughs> Um, you know, I've always thought that, um, I guess, that right wins out in the end. And um, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to believe that because sometimes bad things happen to good people. But I still truly believe that. I, I believe that right ends, ends up winning. And if you conduct yourself if you conduct yourself the way you should, uh, then you will end up being okay, I guess, essentially. Um, now, you know, I sometimes have that called to question uh, in what I do, and sometimes I have it called to question in my personal life. But I think that's, I think that's accurate, and I, re I really do believe that. Um, I also believe that it's important um, it's important for judges particularly uh, to have a good heart, for want of a better word, and um, that you can't be a judge uh, if you are mad at the world, uh, if you have something, uh, that somebody that you want to get even with, uh, that a judge has to come to the bench and with, with a good heart. Now, there are a lot of other things that a judge has to come to the bench with. Uh, you hope that a judge comes to the bench uh, being intelligent and, and competent and, and is willing to work hard and all that sort of thing, but I don't think there's any substitute 
for um, for having a good heart, uh, which is probably there could probably be a better description than than what I have have said. But um, um, I guess those are two of my two of my core beliefs. What is the greatest book you've ever read in terms of your life, your goals, and your ideals? Well, there was a book that had a great influence on my life, and uh, it, maybe it was because of when I read the book. Uh, but in about 1972, I would say, or 73, I read a book uh, called The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. And I didn't know who Betty Friedan was when I read the book. I didn't know what the feminine mystique was when I read the book. But I read that book, and it essentially changed the way I looked at the rest of my life. And that may sound impossible, but that's the truth. It was, it was at a point in time uh, in, in my, my personal life uh, when things were changing anyway. And um, I had an opportunity to keep doing the same thing that I was doing, or I had the opportunity to change my life. And it was immediately after reading The Feminine Mystique that I decided that I was going to change the way I was handling my life, and I was going to go back to law school, or I was going to go to law school, which I did, and uh, I was going to do certain things about where I lived, and I could be certain things that I'd never, it never occurred to me that I could be before. And, um, you know, after the fact, I've sub subsequently, I subsequently found out who Betty Friedan was, and I subsequently found out that she was very active in the women's movement in the 1970s, and uh, I uh, found all that out after I read her book. But her book had a huge effect on me, and um, uh, it just came along at the right time in my life, and it said to me, you know, you don't have to go back and teach school if you don't want to. Uh, you can if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to uh, do all of these things that you have grown up thinking that this is the way your life is going to be. There are all sorts of opportunities out there for you. And um, literally changed my life. Well, that kind of leads right into the next question. Um, turning points. Has your life had turning points? And I guess you just described a major turning point. Are, are there any others you'd like to share with us? Well, we probably talked about a lot of my turning points. Uh, a big turning point was exactly what I just talked about when I made the decision to go to law school. Uh, another turning point was uh, when I became a county court judge. Uh, and we discussed that earlier when um, I made the decision that uh, I was going to go forward instead of backwards as far as uh, being a uh, woman on the bench. Um, so th those were probably the two major turning points in my life. Um, there have been some, some minor ups and downs since then, but um, those were probably the two major turning points. How can we help others, whether they be women, law students, and you, you've even talked to elementary school students, how can we lead others to, the, to a higher road? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we can. I think that the only thing we can do is to be an example. And if we can be an example and they're willing to follow uh, an example then, and they're willing to, to learn, then, then we can. Uh, I think, I think, um, I think it's important not only for lawyers but for judges even uh, to go out into the community as we've discussed before and to uh, go uh, even to uh, the schools and, and talk to classes and to have them come into your courtroom if, if uh, you can uh, and see what you do. Uh, I think those students that come over from Stetson uh, and are our interns um, 
I think we can serve as an example. I think you can make sure your law clerks serve as an example. And in my particular situation, I have law clerks who work for me for several years uh, and then go on to uh, be lawyers. And I certainly uh, have the obligation, I think, and I have the opportunity. Uh, to be uh, their mentor and to help them and to serve as an example for them. Uh, I'm not sure that we can, can lead people. I, I think we can do our best to make sure that uh, we can be a good example and, and hope, that, um, hope that they do the right thing. If you're absolutely guaranteed that your advice would be followed, what advice would you give to those in the legal profession? <laughs> you know, I guess I, I would say to, to lawyers in the legal profession that you need to treat other lawyers well. You need to treat other lawyers like you would want to be treated uh, because I hear so often lawyers saying, well, we're distressed with the legal profession, that uh, I want to get out of the legal profession, uh, I'm not happy in the profession, and a lot of that is because of not what happens in court, but what happens outside of the court and the way they're being treated by their fellow lawyers. And if I could say anything to the profession, it would be probably treat others the way you would like to be treated. Uh, and that's going to make your life a whole lot easier as well as their life a lot easier. You mentioned that you have children. Based upon your experience with the legal profession, would you recommend the practice of law to your children or to your grandchildren? Yeah, I think I would. Neither of my children are lawyers, uh, and neither of them ever considered going into the legal profession. But yes, I think I would. Um, I think I think the I think the profession is a profession where you can feel proud about what you do. I think you can help others. Uh, I think you can make a real impact on on society. So yeah, I I would recommend it. And this is the last question. Can you reach <laughs> over and pick up that rock? <laughs> Tell us about that rock. Why is that rock important to you? Well, this, this I don't know, can you see this rock? Uh, this, this is uh, a good day, and, and this, is the way, <laughs> this is the way I like to look most of the time, uh, with a happy face. But a good portion of the time, I look like this. I don't which believe is an that. unhappy face. Can you change your day by turning the rock over? I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could. I would keep it on the happy face. Judge Bucklew, it has been a pleasure interviewing you and having you sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much for giving us of your time. And uh, I just want to say that you have given all of us in the legal community so much by leading by your example. Oh, thank well, you. Thank you.